somebody isn't killed. I mean, people just tend to disappear and not come back. All right, well, let's just go ahead and get started, and let's do this. Uh, quantitative relationships in chemistry. I think out of there. <laughs> um, before we actually start this, I've had a couple people ask me, you know, questions about you know, this topic or that topic or whatever. Um, I wanted to remind everybody that one of the features of the Chemistry Online site is something called a micro-tutorial. I'm sitting here and listening to an hour lecture or two-hour lecture, whatever, that, uh, that I do. It's really painful, even for me. Um, <laughs> these guys are um, five to minutes or so, and they're on a single topic. So if there's something that you don't quite get and you want to hear again, um, a nice, simple way to do it is to go to the micro-tutorials here. Um, just flip down through your chapters. Um, one that we're doing today is this guy. Um, this is on, I forgot which one, but it's uh, stoichiometry. And what it does, it just goes through only the slides to do with that and explains it slowly and clearly, hopefully. And so if you have a question, in five minutes, you can almost always get it resolved. And virtually every major topic in the course is covered here, so it's a nice way to review if there's something that's just sticking with you. All right, quantitative things in chemistry. We're basically talking about stoichiometry again. Um, we talked about this, reactants going to products, um, the arrow here, of course, has the properties of an equal sign. This is aluminum as an element, bromine as an element, reacting with the compound aluminum bromide. Uh, this is our equation. Uh, it is not balanced, is it? If you look at it here, we have one aluminum and one aluminum, that's fine. But we have three bromines and only two here. Um, to make them both even, we would want to double this, which means we would need two aluminums. And that gives us six bromines, so we would need three Br2s. So it would look something like this. Come on. There we go. Two aluminums, three bromines, two aluminum bromides. Now, when we talk about the stoichiometry of a reaction, what we're going to do today is to use the basic concept of stoichiometry to calculate what's known as a theoretical yield. That is, if the reaction went perfectly, we would expect two aluminums, three bromines, to give us two aluminum bromides. That's the theoretical yield in this reaction. Now, in reality, theoretical yields um, are very seldom observed. And that's because um, the way chemical reactions occur, there are many, many different pathways that can be followed. The one that we typically describe is the major pathway. But there are lots of side reactions that can happen as well. Um, side reactions take away from the theoretical yield. They give us the, quote, actual yield. And later in the uh, chapter here, we'll talk about 
how to calculate that as a percentage. But again, theoretical yield is simply based on the stoichiometry. Two aluminums, three bromines, two aluminum bromides. So let's look at a simple stoichiometry problem here. We have ethanol. Ethanol is the alcohol of consumption. Um, it burns. That means it reacts with oxygen. When it does, it gives carbon dioxide and water. If we have two and a half moles of ethanol, how many moles of CO2 will we get? That's the question. Now we're going to do this problem two ways. First of all, we're going to use our uh, given ratio algorithm method. Because that, that's simple, that always works. And then we're going to do um, what I refer to as a pair of ratios. It's the same thing effectively, but it's even a little simpler than that. So let's look at this in terms of a given fine sort of thing. According to this equation, one mole of ethanol gives us two moles of CO2. So that's a ratio. We can say one ethanol, two carbon dioxides. That's a ratio. Now up here, we are given that we have two and a half moles of ethanol. So we have a given, and from the stoichiometry here, of one to two, we have a ratio. Our given, once again, two and a half moles of ethanol. Our ratio, one mole of ethanol, gives us two moles of CO2. Now I've set up this ratio this way because the units of given, remember, as moles of ethanol, have to be in the denominator. That's the rule. So when we set this up, we're simply going to take our given, multiply it by our ratio, and we're going to find the number of moles of CO2. There's our given. Once again, our ratio. We get two CO2s for every ethanol. The way this is set up, moles of ethanol will cancel on both sides. We're only left with moles of CO2 as our um, fine. So we uh, simply do our multiplication, two and a half times two. I can either do that in my head. That gives us five moles of CO2. So looking at our problem, if we had two and a half moles of ethanol, we would get five moles of CO2. Our ratio here is one, gives us two, two and a half times two, is five. Any questions? So let's do this again using a pair of ratios. Again, this is even going to be simpler. We're going to do two molar ratios, a known and an unknown. What you do is you want to look at your problem and figure out what two parts of the problem you're working with. And it's going to be CO2 and ethanol. So again, we look at our stoichiometry. One mole gives us two moles. So we can set up our first known ratio simply by taking the ethanol to CO2 ratio. And that's two moles of CO2 for every mole of ethanol. That's straight from the equation. Now, the unknown ratio. What are we trying to find? We're trying to find moles of CO2, right? So let's call that X. 
Nice thing to call it. We'll call it X. How many moles of ethanol are we given? Two and a half. So our unknown ratio is simply going to be X over 2.5. All right, so we have an unknown ratio, we have a known ratio. Mathematically, you would solve this by taking two and a half and multiplying it by this step, right? So it would look like this. Now, this is exactly the same equation that we just had for um, the given find or given ratio method, right? There's our given, there's our ratio. And again, these cancel. So the two methods are entirely equivalent. To solve for x, we're going to take 2.5, multiply it by 2, and that's 5 moles of CO2. Now, in this chapter, we're going to focus on using the ratio method. A known ratio and an unknown ratio. It actually makes it much simpler once you get going. Any questions? Well, let's look at another one. Calcium reacts with hydrochloric acid. We get hydrogen gas bubbling off, and we form calcium chloride in solution. All right. We want to know how many moles of HCl we need to react with 3.25 <clears throat> moles of calcium. So we're only dealing with our reactants here, HCl and calcium. So the first thing you want to do is look at your ratio here, your known ratio. How many calciums and how many HCl's? Um, HCl is what we're trying to find, so you kind of like want to put that on the top. That makes it easier. So our ratio here would be one mole or two moles of HCl over one mole of calcium. Now, our unknown. We're trying to find the number of moles of HCl. Well, that's x, right? So that's going to be up here. That's going to be x. And we have 3.25 moles of calcium. It's going to be on the bottom. And it's going to look like this. Now, just like before, all we have to do is take 3.25, multiply by 2, divide by 1. The equation will look like this. Again, entirely equivalent to our given ratio thing. That's given, there's our ratio. And moles of calcium cancel. We do our math, 3.25 times 2, 6.5 moles of HCl. So again, to react with 3.25 moles of calcium, we need twice as many moles of HCl. Any questions? Simple molar stoichiometry. Let's do one more. Ethane is a hydrocarbon. Reacts with oxygen, that means it burns, to give CO2 and water. But we look at this, and the first thing we want to say is, oh my goodness, this equation isn't balanced, is it? Now we learned last chapter how to balance. So quickly look at this and stick in your coefficients. I will pause for a moment.
so I'm going to try to use this thing again. I hope I can figure it out. First thing I would do is say, gee, we have two carbons on this side and only one on this side. So let's start out by putting a two in there. So now we have the same number of carbons, right? Um, we have six hydrogens on this side and only two on this side. So we would need to stick a three in here, wouldn't we? So our carbon and our hydrogen is all balanced. But what have we done here? Our oxygen is really off, isn't it? We have an odd number of oxygens now. So what I want to do is just go back and double everything. If we have an odd number of oxygens, I can fix that just by doubling. So instead of two, let's make this four. Instead of three, let's make this six. Now to get four carbons, we need two of these guys. So that works. We have six times two is 12 hydrogens. Six times two is 12, that works. How many oxygens do we need now? Well, let's see, let's count. We have eight and six. We need seven of them. Because remember, they come in pairs. So let's I'll see if I can erase this. And then push my button. And by gosh, we got it right. So this is one of the things that you do when you balance more complex equations. If you go and you fix it and you wind up again with another odd or something. Just try doubling everything and then just keep going. Uh, th this is a little more complex. All right, so let's work with our problem here. We are given that we have 1.7 moles of CO2. We want to know how many moles of oxygen are involved. So we're dealing with oxygen, CO2, as our pair. So step one, we look at our equation. It takes seven moles of oxygen to get four moles of CO2. So our ratio is going to be seven to four. Now we're trying to find moles, that's our x, so let's put oxygen on the top. Seven moles of oxygen, four moles of CO2. Our unknown here is moles of oxygen, so that's an X. And our given here is 1.7 moles of CO2, so that's going to go down in the denominator. And our unknown ratio then will look like that. Solving it is really simple. I'm going to take 1.7 and multiply it by this group. Again, our given and our ratio. Moles of CO2 are going to cancel. We're only left with moles of oxygen. So the math is just 1.7 times 7 divided by 4. 2.975. Now, we are dealing with the significant figures, right? How do we round this? It ends in exactly 5, right? Exactly 5. So what do we do? We round so it's even. 2.98.
Now, it's a fairly simple concept, isn't it? You decide which pair you're dealing with in your reaction. You set up a ratio. You define your unknown as x. This is on the denominator under x. And you do your calculation. Any questions? Well, of course, there's a uh, tutorial here. <laughs> Again, this kind of describes what you're going to do, just to remind you. Uh, so this is just a sample problem. Here we're trying to find the moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate given 0.82 moles of sodium carbonate. So the two things we're dealing with here are going to be sodium hydrogen carbonate and sodium carbonate. That's our pair. We're trying to find moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate, so we want this to be on the top. That's our x. So our ratio is just going to be two of these guys or one of these. Our unknown ratio is going to be how many sodium hydrogen carbonates and then 0.8217 moles of sodium carbonate. That's the unknown ratio. Mathematically, we just take 2, multiply it by this, divide by this, And we wind up with 1.643 moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate. <clears throat> you identify the species, you come up with the mole ratio, 2 to 1. Our unknown ratio is simply this divided by our given, and then you solve. Let's do one more, and I'll hush. Go ahead and work this. We're dealing here with chloroethane and chlorine. Chloroethane is an organic molecule. It takes four chloroethanes to get two chlorines. So our ratio here is going to be four and two. We're trying to find moles of chloroethane, so we want that to be our x. We want chloroethane to be in the numerator. So we're going to have x moles of this and 0.9922 moles of chlorine. Our ratio here is 4 to 2. <clears throat> this is our x and this is our given 0.9922. Mathematically all we have to do is multiply our ratio by our given, and we wind up with 1.984 moles of chlorine. Any questions? Nice and simple, really. I mean, stoichiometry can be very complicated. But if you think about it this way, you should look at your equation, 
come up with your mole ratio. Then the mole ratio of what you're trying to find, and you got it. All right, we can also do the problem slightly differently. In lab, we don't tend to measure things in moles, do we? We tend to weigh them out on the balance. We call them grams. So if we have zinc sulfide reacting with oxygen to get zinc oxide, and we have and we have 25 grams of zinc sulfide, how many grams of zinc oxide are we going to get? Now, you know, you could do this two ways. You could do it the hard way, which we're not going to do. The hard way, we would say, OK, we can look at our periodic table here. We can figure out how many moles 25 grams of zinc sulfide is. And then we could do it just like we did on the previous slides. OK, just do it in moles. And then when we get our answer in moles, convert it to grams by doing the molar mass of zinc oxide. So we can do that. But what we're going to do is we're going to set up ratios instead of simply in moles, we're going to use grams. Same thing. Because we know one mole of zinc oxide, one mole of zinc sulfide, has a certain molar mass, doesn't it? So, we know that we have one mole of zinc sulfide giving us one mole of zinc oxide. Now, that says two to two, but that's the same as one to one, isn't it? So that works. Well, one mole of zinc sulfide is the same as 97 grams of zinc sulfide. We get that simply by adding the molar mass of zinc and sulfur. And one mole of zinc oxide is the same as one mole of zinc, one mole of oxygen, and it's 81 grams. So instead of writing it this way, we can write it this way. Instead of just putting in the number of moles, like this, we can put in the two molar masses. The same thing. Now, we're trying to find how many grams of zinc oxide there are. And we have 25 grams of zinc sulfide. So, zinc sulfide, we have 25 grams. And this is what we're trying to find. Now, I hate it when I do this. <clears throat> you know, mentally, the math is just so much more transparent. It matches is up here in the numerator, isn't it? But sometimes when you're setting the problems up, you don't think ahead. And you just set them up upside down. Well, if you do, very simple solution. All you do is turn them both upside down, like that. Now, how is that legal? We're taking the reciprocal on both sides. You can do the same thing on both sides of an equation, remember. So we just take both of these, flip them upside down, and now we have zinc oxide up where it belongs. <clears throat> the math is now trivial. 25 times 81 divided by 97. Uh, result, 20.9 grams of zinc oxide. <clears throat> so what we've done here, instead of just writing this in terms of moles, we converted moles into grams. And again, we can do that because this is the molar mass of zinc oxide. That's equal to one mole of zinc oxide. 97.46 grams is the same as one mole of zinc sulfide. 
So the two are entirely equivalent. Any questions on the concept? All right, well, let's do it again. <clears throat> Here we're taking fluorine and water, and we're making hydrogen, fluoride, and oxygen. So that's our equation. Let's see. We're looking for grams of water, so that's our unknown. That's our X. And we have 62 grams of HF. So we're looking at water and HF. Once again, this is all grams, isn't it? All grams. So, we look at our mole ratio here. Two moles of water, four moles of HF. So that's going to be our mole ratio. But we have to express that in terms of grams. So let's start off just with our simple mole ratio. One mole of water weighs how much? 18 grams. One mole of HF weighs 20 grams. So I'm just going to take my number of moles and my molar masses, and I'm going to multiply them. Now when I do that, everything is going to cancel here except grams. And we wind up with this thing. This is called a mass ratio. Simple way to think about a mass ratio. Simple way. If I have 36 grams of water, I'm going to get 80 grams of HF. That's how you think about a mass ratio. In this reaction, 30 grams, 36 grams of water will give me 80 grams of HF. Now we can substitute that mass ratio just like all the other ratios we've been doing. So if we take this as our known, and we're trying to find grams of water, that's x, we are given 62 grams of HF, that's this. Once again, the math is really simple. We do 62 times 36 divided by 80, and we get 28 grams of water. Mass ratios. Mass ratios are nothing more than the stoichiometric coefficient, 2 and 4 here, multiplied by the molar mass. Once again, think about it in the concept. 36 grams of water gives 80 grams of HF. Makes it nice and compact and simple. So let's do another tutorial. Mass ratios. So all of these are going to be given in grams. What is this stuff? COO. What would you call that? Cobalt. Cobalt. We need a Roman numeral here. It has to be cobalt 2 oxide, doesn't it? Because oxygen will be minus 2, so this has to be cobalt 2. This is also cobalt oxide, but what is it? Three. Cobalt 3 oxide. So here we're converting cobalt 2 oxide to cobalt 3 oxide. And we're doing that by reaction with oxygen. All right, so let's see. How many grams of cobalt 2 reacted with 40.9 grams? If well, let's see. How many grams reacted? So this is our X. How many grams reacted? If we got 40.9 grams 
of cobalt green. So we're looking here at cobalt 2 and cobalt 3 as our pair. Our ratio here, our uh, molar ratio is going to be 4 to 2, right? We are given molar masses. <coughs> we have one cobalt here, we have, well, we have four of these, we have two of these. So, we're going to write a mole ratio and then convert that to a mass ratio. Our mole ratio is simply going to be four moles of cobalt 2 to two moles of cobalt 3. Our mass ratio, we have to multiply this now by the molar mass of cobalt 2, that's this guy, and multiply 2 here by the molar mass of cobalt 3. So 4 times 79, 74.9, 2 times 165, multiply that out. And we're going to multiply this by our given, which is 40.9 grams of cobalt. Um, three, that's what we got. Again, our grams of cobalt are going to cancel. And we're only left with grams of cobalt oxide. Do our simple math. 40 times 4 times 75 divided by 2, divided by 166, and we get 37 grams. So exactly the same thing we did in the other tutorial here, except we're putting in this step of converting it into a mass ratio. Any questions? general chemistry, we would now talk about limiting reactions. Limiting reactions um, terrify general chemistry students, but they really shouldn't. When you have a limiting reactant problem, what it means is that you're given molar amounts of both reactants, and they're not, they're not always identical to what you need to do the reaction. One will typically be in excess. The one that's not in excess is called the limiting reactant. Um, there's some horrendous math that you can do here, but we're not going to do it. That's the good news. Instead, we're going to look at gloves. If you have children, you know about gloves. In our pile here, we have four left-handed gloves and three right-handed. How many pairs of gloves can you make? You can only make three, right? You can only make three. And there's one left over. In this case, the left-handed gloves are in excess. We have one left over. Right-handed gloves are limiting as to how many pairs you can make. So in terms of chemistry, the limiting reactant here would be right-handed gloves, only three of them, and we can only get three moles of product. And we're left with something left over. That's all in the world limiting reactant problems are. So let's do this in terms of real chemistry. If you take fluorine and react it with chlorine, you can make chlorine trifluoride. Okay? So what if I showed you this picture? 
Here we have one, two, three molecules of chlorine. Chlorine is, is green. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six molecules of fluorine. How many moles of fluorine trifluoride are we going to make? Every atom of fluorine here requires three fluorines, doesn't it? So we have six atoms of fluorine. We would need 18 atoms of fluorine. How many do we have? Only have 12, don't we? So how many can we make? We can make four CLF3s, and we have one fluorine left over. In terms of chemistry, <laughs> The limiting reactant here is fluorine because we didn't have enough. The excess reactant here is chlorine because chlorine is left over. All I want you to understand about limiting reactants for our next exam is this simple notion that if you don't have um, equal molar quantities as described in the chemical equation that you're going to have something left over. And that's called excess and the other one is called limiting. So let's look at a real test question. Think about this one for a second. We have nine moles of fluorine and three moles of chlorine. Is there excess chlorine? Excess chlorine is chlorine limiting, or have we consumed everything? Yeah, look at your equation here. It's for every mole of chlorine, you need three chlorines, don't you? We have three chlorines, nine fluorines. That works, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. All the reactants have been consumed. So make sure that you understand the concept here enough that you can approach a question like this on the exam. All right, let's do one more trick here. Way back at the start, we looked at the reaction of aluminum and bromine to give aluminum bromide. Two moles of aluminum bromide here are our theoretical yield. Once again, that means if everything worked well, three moles of bromine would give us two moles of aluminum bromide. The theoretical yield here is two moles of aluminum bromide. Now, this doesn't always quite work that way. Like I said, you will always get less stuff than you expect. And what we're going to do is learn to calculate a percentage yield. So let's look at an example. Here we have chloroacetic acid, an organic compound. Again, reacting with oxygen, so it's burning. We're making carbon monoxide, water, and HCl. How many moles of oxygen reacted with chloroacetic acid if we got 0.2645 moles of carbon monoxide? Now, this is just a simple molar stoichiometry problem, isn't it? According to our equation, one mole of oxygen 
yields four moles of carbon monoxide. So we're looking at this here. We're going to set up our ratios between oxygen and CO. One mole of oxygen, four moles of CO. Now, we have 0.26 moles of carbon monoxide that we made, and our moles of oxygen is our X. So, we have 0.26 times one divided by four, how many moles of oxygen? Well, 0.066125, how do we round this to four significant figures? Well, we're going to round down, aren't we? Again, we must make it even. So this is our theoretical yield here. We should get 0.06612 moles of oxygen. Here's another one. Boric acid is going to decompose and make this boric acid anhydride and liberate water. How many grams of this? 36.3 grams of boric acid. So we're going to need a mole ratio here, right? So let's set this up. We know we have six moles of boric acid one mole of the boric anhydride. So six to one is our ratio. <clears throat> We're gonna set up our ratios here. One mole of anhydride, six moles of boric acid. We're trying to find grams, so we need to make this into a mole, or I'm sorry, a mass ratio. So all we have to do is multiply these by the molar masses. For boric anhydride, it's 244. For boric acid, it's 61.8. Multiply these out. And again, the way to think about the mass ratio, we will get 245 grams of anhydride for every 371 grams of boric acid we have. That's all the mass ratio tells us. Just how many grams of this or grams of that. All right. Here's our mass ratio. We're trying to find grams of anhydride, so that's X. And we have 36 grams of acid. 36 times 245 divided by 371, our theoretical yield is 24 grams. So theoretical yield is exactly the same exercise we've done all day. Either in moles or grams, it's just a theoretical yield. All right, we've just done the theoretical yield. We, we can do that with moles or with mass. The actual yield is what we actually get. Now, you know, this can be from parallel reactions. It can be that you were in a lab and your lab partner sneezed and blew half the stuff out the, you know, on the floor, whatever. Actual yield is what you wind up with. Percentage yield is simply the ratio. How much you actually got, how much you should get, multiplied by 100. That's the percentage. Simple example, popcorn. Here I have 20 kernels of popcorn. Okay, what's our theoretical yield here? 
20 popped kernels. have 16 that popped, 4 that did not. What's our percent yield? Theoretical was 20. Actual is 16. Divide the two, multiply by 100. This is 80% yield. That's all in the world percent yield problems are. How many moles or how many grams you're supposed to get, how many moles or grams you actually do get, take the ratio, multiply by 100. That's simple, isn't it? Chemical problem. We're taking aluminum and sulfur and making aluminum sulfide. This is actually a very neat reaction. It like goes off with great vigor. <clears throat> we have five moles of sulfur. We should get 1.7 moles of aluminum sulfide. That's our theoretical yield. We should get that. When it's all done reacting, we get one and a half moles. What's our percentage yield? What you actually get, divide by what you should get, times 100. So 1.5 divided by 1.7 times 100, 88%. So that's all in the world is this is. What you should get. What you do get, what you do get is always in the numerator. What you should get times 100. So let's do a real problem here. NO reacts with oxygen to give NO2. We have 10 grams of NO. We get 9.7 grams of NO2. What's our percent yield. Let's start off with our mole ratio. We're dealing with NO and NO2. So that's a two to one. No, two to two. So that's one to one, isn't it? So that's good. One mole of NO gives one mole of NO2. <clears throat> These are our molar masses. So we're going to convert this to a mass ratio. 29 divided by uh, 45.98 is the same thing as one mole and one mole. Our number of moles here. We had 10 grams of NO, and it weighs 30 grams per mole. Mass over molar mass gives us what? Moles. Over here for NO2, our mass was 9.7 grams. Our molar mass is 46. Mass over molar mass gives us moles. And we got 0.21. Now we started here with 0.33, didn't we? So how many moles of NO2 should we get? 0.33, but we didn't. So to calculate percent yield, simply take what you got divided by what you should get times 100. Oh, 
0.21 divided by 0.33 times 100. This went in 63% yield. Now our third tutorial for this chapter. <clears throat> We're going to take our gram quantities here. We're going to make a mass ratio. We know how to do that. That's simply the molar ratio multiplied by molar masses. We're going to figure out what our theoretical yield should be. The problem tells us what we actually get. 6.63 grams, and we'll simply take a percentage. So we're dealing here with trifluoroethane and carbon monoxide. So that's our pair. One mole of trifluoroethane reacts with two moles of CO. One mole, two moles. We're going to calculate our theoretical yield using the mass ratio method. So, carbon monoxide weighs 28, trifluoroethane weighs 84. We have 2 to 1, so multiply these together. Our mass ratio for every 56 grams of CO we have 84 grams of trifluoroethane. Again, that's, that's how you think about a mass ratio. Now, we have 15.6 of trifluoroethane. That's our given. There's our ratio. These guys are going to cancel. Simply multiply 15.6 <coughs> times 56 divided by 84. If all was well in the world, we would get 10.4 grams of CO. That's our theoretical yield. Now what do we really get? We got 6.63. Therefore, our theoretical is 10.4, actual is 6.63. What's our percentage? I will pause for a moment while you set it up. Actual over theoretical times 100. And we're at 63.8. Let's do another one. Here we have 49.6 grams of carbon. I'm told here that the reaction goes in 48% yield. How many grams of CO are we going to get? Now here we're given the yield. So we have to take the yield, the percent yield, and what we're reacting, and our molar ratio, our mass ratio, and figure out our theoretical yield now. So this is how we would do that. Our mass ratio, 4 moles of CO for every 5 moles of carbon, 4 and 5, right? Our molar mass is 28 grams and 12 grams. So the mass ratio relating those two is simply for every 60 grams of carbon, you get 112 grams of CO. That's our mass ratio. Now, 
we're dealing with 49.6 grams of carbon. These guys are going to cancel. So we should get 92 grams of CO. That's our theoretical yield. Calculated the standard way. So we have our theoretical yield. We know our percent yield. So to get the actual yield, all you have to do is multiply 0.48 times this. Can you be a 49 and Hmm? Go back. Sorry. But th that is um, 48.8. This is our percent yield in the problem. Right. So we're given that it only goes in 48%. I'm saying, but how do you get 92.5? Um, how do we get 92.5? Well, again, we set up our mass ratio here. We look at our problem. Four moles to five moles, okay? Every mole weighs 28, every mole weighs 12. So if we multiply them together, get our ratio. For every 60 grams of carbon, we get 112 grams of CO. That's what the mass ratio tells you. Now, you did 49.6 times. 49.6, that's our given. See, that was hidden by the slide. We are given that we have 49.6 grams of carbon. So all we've done is multiply our given by our ratio, cancel, and we get grams of CO. Yeah, this is the same type of problem we've done basically all day. Just using a mass ratio method. All right, so our theoretical was 92.5. We're given that we have 48% yield. So what was our actual yield? Remember, 48% is 0.48. This is what we're supposed to get. 0.488 times 92.5. Our actual yield was only 45 grams of CO. Now, these are fun, so let's do one more. <laughs> you know, this kind of brings it all together. The mass ratio concept, the mole ratio concept, etc. Here we have 96.9 grams of oxygen, so we're dealing with oxygen. And we're getting 18 grams of water. So the pair that we're looking at is oxygen and water. Our stoichiometry is going to be 13 to 10. Now every oxygen weighs 32, every water weighs 18. So we're going to set up mass ratio here. 13 oxygens, 10 waters, and again, these are our masses. 10 waters, each one weighs 18. 13 oxygens, each one weighs 32. Ratio, for every 400 grams of oxygen, we get 180 grams of water. That's what the mass ratio tells you. All right, now we are given that we have 96.9 grams of oxygen. That's our given. Here 
there's our ratio. So we simply multiply these together. Our given, our ratio. The grams of O2 cancel. Just left with grams of water. Our theoretical yield. The theoretical yield is simply going to be 96.9 times 180 divided by 416 or 42 grams. So if everything worked well, we would get 42 grams of water. What did we get? 18 grams of water. Oh my goodness. So our theoretical here is 42. We only got 18. What's our percentage? Actual divided by theoretical times 100. Eighteen divided by forty-two times a hundred, forty-three point eight percent. Now on the exam, um, um, these things are going to be presented in terms of concepts more than real complicated calculations. But to get yourself prepared. Remember, we have three tutorials we've done. So geometry, mass ratios, and percentage yield, five points each on the next exam. OK? So let's do our best and get this done.